I am very happy to see many new faces here at the 8th, which is our second service here at St. Mark. But let me ask a straight up question. Why did you come to church today? You could have done 10,000 other things that's on your plate right now for you to do. You could have gotten an extra couple hours of sleep. But you decided to get up this morning and come. Or even here's a better question. Why did you come to an Orthodox church? Why did you come to an Orthodox church today? I promise you, on your way to church here, you passed by half a dozen other churches. So why did you put effort from telling yourself last night, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this whole church thing tomorrow. Why did you tell yourself last night? Why did you get up? Why did you put everything else aside and come to church? And why specifically to an Orthodox church? At some point in time, we're going to be asked these questions. And for a lot of people, at least in my experience when I, when I was a dentist working in the office, they would say, why are you doing this whole church thing? I mean, religion has been the source of all war and, and conflict and tension in the world. So why are you even doing this whole thing? Somebody might ask you these two questions at some point in time, if they haven't already. And your answer to these questions could completely change someone's life. Your answer to these questions could completely change someone's life by the way you answer these questions. I remember when I was working, I would take off all of Holy Week. And like I, I wanted to do that. Like I, but, like I grew up kind of just doing the whole like Good Friday thing and then Easter and that was it. But I, I felt like I was just like entering the end. I, I couldn't capture the full experience of what Holy Week was. So I, you know, when I started working, I, I took the, Holy, the whole week off. And my assistants would ask me, like, like why? Like, what, like, you're not going on vacation? They would say, you know, see you, Dr. G, are you going on vacation? I'd be like, no, I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to church. But, it, like, Easter was last week. I, I know, it's kind of confusing. But, yeah. <laughs> I, but why are you taking off, like, all week? Isn't, like, the Easter service just, like, you know, an hour on Sunday? And I'm like, well, I'm, I just go. And, and I'll, I'll be honest. I missed an opportunity. I gave horrible answers. So I was like, uh, yeah, I got to go. You know, I'll, I'll see you guys later. And I never really gave an answer. I kind of like, shied away from, from the question altogether. And I missed an opportunity. They were curious. But I completely missed an opportunity of explaining something. I want to jump into a very interesting interaction that Jesus had with someone 2,000 years ago. This interaction was counter-cultural in every sense of the word. It was completely against culture. And many of us have heard of this encounter of Jesus meeting a woman at the well. And it was a big no-no for various reasons. But I, we'll get to that encounter in a little bit. But I want to capture what happened right after that encounter with Jesus, with this woman at the well, who was from Samaria. And there's a very interesting encounter that Jesus had with his disciples after he had this one-on-one -on -one conversation with this woman. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. At this point, you know the disciples are Middle Eastern because they're going up to Jesus and says, come on, you know, it's, you know what, do you, what do you want to eat? What food do you want me to get you for you, Jesus? And they're always concerned about Jesus eating something. So his disciples urged him, you know, Jesus, eat something. You know, you look like you're hungry. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Like, could, did someone, like, did he do Uber Eats? Did somebody bring him food? Like, did he already eat before? Like, he said he's not hungry. Did somebody else bring him food? Did somebody else make him food? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There was a fourth century Christian by the name of St. John Chrysostom. And when he read this encounter, after he read this passage of Jesus with the woman at the well, and then this, in, in this interaction that Jesus had with his disciples, he noted something very unique, and he had this beautiful meditation of saying that Jesus is wanting to take a, a, a normal conversation that Jesus had with, with the woman at the well, a normal conversation that he had with his disciples, and how Jesus took that to point his disciples to something so much more. He wanted the conversation to go to something so much more. They're worried about, you know, is Jesus hungry? What is he in the mood for? Is he fasting? He's not fasting. They, they're focusing on that part. But Jesus is saying, you guys don't get it. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. That we, we can go grab something to eat. But you're missing the point as far as food. I'm talking about a completely different type of food. 
You're worried about where we're getting catering. You're worried about where we're, eating, where we're having lunch. I'm talking about something else. And he's pointing to something so much more than that. Back to the question. I'm sorry. Let's continue. My bad. Don't you have a saying? This is Jesus saying. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So imagine now Jesus is done with this encounter with this woman at the well. He goes back to his disciples and he's chatting with them. And he says, you guys are not getting the whole food thing. And then he tells them, don't you guys have a saying? Like some of you guys are farmers. Don't you guys have like a, this little lingo that you say as farmers? Isn't it four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Again, Jesus is taking something tangible, something real. He sees like a bunch of corn crops around in the field. And he says, look, don't you see that they're white? Don't you see that they're ready? Don't you see they're ready to be picked and to be eaten? Look, they're ready. What on earth is Jesus trying to tell his disciples about food and telling them to go look at the harvest? Like what? I'm sure the disciples were like, what on earth? He must be really hungry because he's really losing it. We don't even know what on earth he's trying to say. Jesus is trying to make a point. Jesus is telling them, people are ready. People are curious to look for more to life. People are wanting to find what's the purpose of life. People are wanting to find out who God is. People are wanting to, to, to look for more. They're ready. Are you doing your part? He's saying the harvest is ready to be picked. People are, are it's, they're ready. But you ain't doing your job. And he's wanting to point him to this encounter that he had with this woman at the well. And he's saying, people are ready. People are curious. People have questions. People are wanting to look for more out of life. And we try to fill it in with some other way. But people are ready. Look around you. They're hungry. And they're wanting something more. Back to the question. Why do you do this whole church thing? Why do you do this whole, I don't know, I kind of did it since I was young. Or, you know, I, I just keep on doing it. Or I just do it out of guilt, you know, because I do a lot of bad things. So I just kind of, like, kind of balance out. I'm like negative two, so if I go plus two today, I'll become pretty good. <laughs> For a lot of us, we have different answers. And someone, if not already, someone will ask you that question. Hey, like, why is your guys' church, like, more than, like, 45 minutes? Like, why do you, why do, you do all this whole church thing? Why do you do this whole church? Like, why, do you, like, why are you so passionate about going? Like every time. I'm telling you, your answer to this question can completely change someone's life. And one thing I want you not to do when you're answering this question is to not just say, well, you know, the Bible says in John 3, 16, that, you know, never begin that answer by just throwing out Bible verses. Because to them, <laughs> if I did that, my coworkers would <laughs> be like, dude, uh, you do your whole church thing. Well, I don't know what church that is. What I want us to do is to say a story. To say a story. There is power in stories. This is how we are wired. By design, we are created where stories appeal to us. They capture us. It's something powerful in stories that, 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 that just is how we're designed by God. And let's capitalize on how God has created us. Last week at the 8, I shared a story of uh, an interesting encounter I had at the movie theater when I went to go see Lion King, me and my wife. And I also shared a story um, about what I'm starting to do tomorrow night, actually, uh, as I'm joining a soccer league. But I promise you, if I ask you what was last week's talk, I guarantee you, 98% of you have no idea what was the topic of last week at the 8. But you do remember the stories. You remember the stories, but you remember nothing else from the talk. Why? I hope you remember more, but the reality is that that's how we all are. Or maybe for today's sermon from Father Samuel, maybe you can't tell me, but you remember he was talking about, I think it's a Netflix show. <laughs> but you remember he was talking about some, some, some drama. We are captivated by stories. I love stories, and you love stories. Jesus loved stories. And this is why when he got together with his disciples or anyone who was curious for looking for more, he would say, hey, once upon a time there was this farmer. Once upon a time, there was this manager of some crops, and he did this. One time, there was a story about a father who had two sons. He would always begin by stories, which we know today as parables. But these are just stories. These are just stories to capture his audience to deliver a divine truth within the story. 
some of them, we believe that some of these stories are true. We believe some of these stories are real. I remember when I went to Israel a, uh, a few years ago, you know, the, the tour guide would say, oh, and here is where Jesus did this, and this is where this miracle happened, and everyone went around. So, I w like, I wanted to play this joke, and, and the boss would say, hey, look, you see that house? That's, that, that's the house of the prodigal son. And everybody would be like, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Do you think that's where the pigs were when he... We think the stories are real. By the way, just newsflash, it's not, it's not a real story, the prodigal, <laughs> just in case somebody thought. It, but we think a lot of these stories are real just because of how Jesus captivated his audience and the amount of details and imagery that he makes in the story makes us think that it's real. But he's using these stories to point to something so much more. If I told you that God loves you, you'd be like, okay. But if I told you that there was a father who had a son, I've captivated you. I've captured you. I made you curious. I'm able to give the same truth, but putting it into a story, it appeals to you. There's something that makes us a little bit more curious when it's a story. And you know who else loves stories besides Jesus? His church. Throughout early Christianity, not many people could read. But how to draw people into the stories of life, into the stories of Jesus, and for them to realize how much God loves them, the church used iconography. The church used iconography to point to who Jesus is and to deliver divine truths of who they are in God. Just to give you one example, this is an icon following the Greek Orthodox tradition, but it still holds the same truths of ancient Christianity. Just to give you an idea, like you might look at this icon and say, there's a lot going on in this icon, but I just want to capture a few things that deliver a story, that deliver a truth. This is traditionally the, the icon of the resurrection. This is traditionally the icon of the resurrection. And you see, you see these caves and you see some darkness and you see Jesus inside the middle of this cave. And you see him holding two people, but he's not holding them in like this kind of way. If you notice, Jesus is holding them from this way, from right here. Here, it seems like, you know, we're buddies, we got this, we're both holding each other. But this is saying, I got you. This is saying, I got you. The church is wanting to deliver a certain message, a certain truth, by Jesus pulling two people out of the grave. These two people are the first two people on planet Earth, Adam and Eve. And Jesus overcame death in order for us to have new life. Jesus overcame death to pull us out from darkness. So the church is wanting to capture a truth that Jesus is down to the lowest parts of the earth to pull Adam and Eve, to pull the prophets, to pull Abraham, to pull Isaac, to pull these the people from the past and say, I'm here to give you a new life. I'm outside of time and space, but I'm here to give you a new life. I'm here to grab you from darkness. I'm here to pull you from your struggles. I'm here to give you resurrection. And this is why the church is, pull, is, 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 is showing Jesus pulling Adam and Eve. Um, he, I have overcome death in order for you to overcome death. I have overcome death in order for you to have life. This is how I want to show you how much I love you, to give you new life. You'll also notice that you see the tops of the, of the, cof, the, top of the coffins are doing a sign of the cross saying now the cross is where we have victory. And you also see two angels on top carrying the cross. Now the cross is not anymore a sign of, of a criminal. Now the cross is, is life. Now the cross is victory. Now the cross is hope. It has a completely different meaning now, completely different meaning. But before this time, it was a sign of, of, of criminals. It was nothing. It was like the worst to be on a cross. But now it becomes hope. It becomes our identity. It becomes new life for us. All, I, I could go on, and actually there's people that get their master's and PhD just in orthodox iconography. Just amount of depth and richness and beauty found in iconography. For us to look at icons and for me to meditate on it and capture the stories within the richness. There's, there's, it's intentional why there's certain colors. It, it, it's intentional why the people don't look absolutely real and, and it's kind of disproportional. All that is on purpose to deliver a story. And that's the beauty of our pre-denominational faith, is that we can utilize the art of our church for us to find out how much God loves us. That's how the church tells the story. But let me tell you how you should not answer your, your story. When you give your story, when somebody asks, why do you do this whole church thing? 
this is two just small suggestions I do not want us to give. It's a free country, you're more than welcome to do as you wish, but I'm telling you, please do not do this. No Christianese. No Christianese. You know what is? When somebody says, you know, you know, what, what, why do you do this whole church thing? Like, why, 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 like, why Christianity? Why Jesus and not kind of like just, just be a good person? Do not say this. Well, you know, I, I feel like I need to die to myself, and I need to crucify my flesh in order to be with Christ. Nobody wants to crucify anything. You tell that to somebody that knows nothing, and you start talking Christianese, that's the last thing they want to hear. Be like, oh, you know, you do, like, you crucify each other at church? I don't want any of that. <laughs> I get what you're saying, but someone that is looking for more out of life, maybe if somebody has zero background of who Jesus is, do not begin your story by saying that. Another thing, don't make it long. Don't make it long. Like, we, we now have an attention span of very short. So the ones that are still with me, hang in there. We're almost done. But our attention span is very short. So do not go like, well, so when I was a kid one time, or please don't do this. Don't say, well, one time like I went to Egypt and, and there was this, and, I, and, and the icon was telling me to do this or to marry this person. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying God cannot work in those ways, 100%, because God is above any tangible thing. And God can work in unbelievable ways. I'm not belittling that at all but do not begin your story by that way do not begin your story that way because you completely lost them you've completely lost them simplicity that was the very first talk that we had in the series on light and, uh, lights of light for us to see that evangelism is simple jesus is simple for us to be the light is simple the greatest missionary saint paul was very simple was very simple he wrote a letter to the city of corinth a second letter to the city of corinth and he made it very simple. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone wants to pursue Christ and they are in him, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. If I'm wanting to pursue Jesus and if I am wanting to be in him and I in him, I'm new. I'm a new person. The, the, the past is gone. I'm a completely new creation in him. What defines me is not my mistakes, not my past. Not, that doesn't define me. I'm a new person in Jesus. End of story. He's keeping it simple, straight to the point. This is who Jesus is. But there's always little whispers in our voice that want to tell us, man, you know your past. You know you struggle with this. You know you do that. But if I'm in Christ, I'm a completely new person. If you're new here to St. Mark, we call our second service here the eight for this exact reason. Maybe for a lot of us, we're like, I don't even know why Father Nate calls it the eight. I don't know why. There are seven days in a week. The eighth day is a brand new day. Today is a brand new day for beginning of a new week. Today is for us, like even our tagline for the eight, is a place to renew and reset life. Maybe my view of church, maybe my view of ancient Christianity, my view of, of how God sees me. Maybe today is a brand new day for me to see myself in a new lens in Christ. Maybe today is a brand new start to, to a, a, a habit I'm working on. Or maybe today is like I, I want to begin a new fresh start in life. Today might be the day. This is why Jesus began new life by overcoming death on a Sunday. On a Sunday, which is the eighth day. If I look at seven days being whole, eight is a brand new day. Eight is a number all throughout human history and in scripture that points to new life, that points to a new beginning. And this has always been my prayer for the second service here at St. Mark Church. That any time they say, I want to give this whole church thing another shot. You know what? Let me, let, me, let me do this whole church thing. That it's a place for me to remind myself, I'm a brand new person. The past does not define me. This struggle does not define me. That I am new in Jesus and keeping it simple at that. Jesus loved to take old things and make it new. And this was his simple message. I'm wanting to find people from darkness to go to light. I'm not, don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcomplicate it. I'm wanting to take people from darkness to light. Simple as that. Even the one who gained sight from Jesus. He said, listen, I'm not some seminary professor. I'm not a theologian. I don't understand even the chemical mechanism of how I was able to see again. But all I know, I was blind. Now I see. I had this life before. But when I pursued Jesus, I'm a better person. That's my story. He didn't use any Christianese. He didn't just say, well, so once upon a time. No, I was this way before, but now with Jesus, I'm like this. 
I still have struggles, but I'm becoming a better person the more I pursue him. That's a story. That's a story. My desire is for all of us to, to, to look and to be intentional about figuring out our story from now. For your sake and because there will become a time where somebody will ask you. And those people are curious. People are looking for more. And your story can be very simple. It does not have to be this, all these big elaborate words. No, it's very simple and straight to the point. Why are you here? Why are you pursuing Jesus? Why are you pursuing Jesus in the ancient faith? We love stories. We love to see things before and after. This is why if you look at any diet marketing campaign, it's always a before and after picture. If I told you, you know, you should really try this diet, it's really good. You're going to be like, okay, prove it to me, Father Nate. I'm going to show you a picture, before and after. This is what will appeal to you. This is how we are wired. If I just tell you about something, you'll be like, okay, that's great. But if I show you before and after, it's different. If, if someone says, you know, why do you do your whole, like, why do you do this whole priest thing? Why do you do this whole church thing? It says, you know what? I lived a life before, but the more I pursue God, I feel like I was a better husband. I was a better father. And I, I feel like I'm better at life. I can see who I am in God better. And that's why I continue to pursue him. And the church asked me to serve him as a priest. Okay. But that my, my story is that I had this life before, but I feel like I'm better with God the more I pursue him. And the more I lose grip of the things in my life and I give it to him, I notice that life is better. Life is better. Keeping it simple. Going back to the encounter that Jesus had this, this weird food conversation with his disciples. One hour before that, he had a very counter-cultural dialogue with a woman at the well. Here you have a man. Here you have a woman. And that historically, in that cultural context, that was like, whoa. Here you have a Jew. Here you have a Samaritan. That was a big no-no. Here you have a very holy man. Here you have not such a holy person. There are such huge differences between these two people. And Jesus embraced these differences. He met these differences intentionally. St. John in his gospel, like we have four gospels of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, who was the first eyewitness of Jesus, wrote down that, that Jesus was going from, from one city called Judea to another city of Galilee. And he had to stop by, by Samaria, and he, and he intentionally had this encounter, this dialogue with this woman. So every cultural thing would say this is a no-no for various reasons. That's why that woman, she didn't go like this, but she was like, whoa, you know, hello, don't you know you're a guy? Don't you know you're a Jew? Don't you know, like, this is like a no-no in our culture? And Jesus broke all those barriers. We are called to be different because Jesus was different. We are called to cross those barriers because Jesus crossed those barriers. Jesus did not just surround himself with good churchy people. He had non-churchy friends, and he broke those barriers to be a light to them. And we are called to be that light to others because Jesus was different as well. So I encourage you for us to approach people that might be cut from a different fabric than you. Because Jesus has asked you to. These are not my words that you are called to be uncomfortable. You are called to be uncomfortable, and I am definitely called to be uncomfortable. Be different because Jesus was different, and be confident because Jesus was confident. Some people, when they say, like, you know, what, 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 you know what's your church? Like, and, I, and I say, oh, it's Orthodox. Uh, and then we, what do we end up saying? Well, it's kind of like, have you seen my big fat Greek wedding? Yeah, it's like that. Or, <laughs> or sometimes we just say, like, you know, like, like when somebody, you, you know, faith or spirituality or religion starts coming into, into the conversation at work or whatever the case might be, we, we end up, as a, as, a, as a way to get out of it, we say, well, you know, you know as long as like, you live a good life and, you know, you do the right thing, like, and you have love in your heart, like, that's, that's what matters. Really? Be confident. Say, you know what, I don't have the answers to a lot of your things, but I know that, G, that love is personified that it's tangible, that it's real. I actually, it's a person. And that's why I like to pursue this person who is love. And he goes by the name Jesus. That's why. I don't know a lot of answers to a lot of questions. I'm still kind of figuring that out myself. But I am better because I found the person who is the definition of love. 
and I'm pursuing him. So yeah, I get that we should all be nice and love one another and, 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 and acceptance. I'm all for that. But like sometimes it's hard for me to grasp what that is. So like God actually made it a little bit easier for me and he became, and he put it in a tangible, real person form. He, be, he put on skin so I can have a clear picture of what love looks like. And he goes by the name Jesus. And that's why I kind of do this whole church thing. And I like to pursue Jesus like in, 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 in the most organic way from, from, from of who Jesus was, of how early people started to follow Jesus. I want to follow him like in that most fullness way. I totally respect other church traditions and Christian traditions. I'm all for it. But if I want to pursue Jesus, I kind of want to pursue him like in this full way, kind of before all like the splits and before there's a lot of reformation in the church. But I totally respect the, the most important part is focusing on him. But I like to pursue him in this way. Be confident. Because Jesus was confident. Jesus didn't end that conversation with the woman at the well and says, you know, you, you do you. You do you. He didn't say that. He said, where's your husband? I'm not saying that you call out people's sins. <laughs> He's Jesus. But he embraced the conversation, an uncomfortable conversation, with confidence. I'll tell you the truth. Even till right now, I told you at the announcements that I encourage you to push people to join a group at the church. I'm telling you, even me as a priest, I, 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 was, I, I had an encounter with someone now saying, like, you know, I, I want you to take the next step. I, I, I get shy myself as the priest to tell someone. But I need to be confident. And what was running through my head was my notes for the talk. That I need to be confident just as Jesus is confident. How am I encouraging my friends? How am I encouraging other members of my church to take that next step? How are we doing that? How are we doing that? Are you encouraging someone else to take that next step? Or when you're talking, are you just finding a way out of it? Saying, you know, that's cool. You know, you do love and respect. I, I, that, that's awesome. That's fine. For, maybe you don't, you don't, you don't you know, they attack them and say, that's, but if the conversation is going in a certain direction, don't find it just a, a way out of it. Maybe God is kind of pinching you to continue the conversation. One hour after Jesus had this, this cultural, shattering encounter, sh cultural shattering encounter with this woman at the well, Jesus told his disciples, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Just as I'm looking for more and you are looking for more, that's why you decided to come this morning. Your coworker, your family friend, maybe extended family member, they're looking for more. Open your eyes and look. People are looking for more. I, I wish I were down the statistic. Like there was a, a, an Orthodox priest that showed a statistic that I, it was, I think it was around 80%. If 80% if, if 80, if 80 people would come to church if someone invited them to come to church. They're waiting for an invitation. People are looking for something more. People are looking for something more. And maybe God is telling us to be bold, to be his light, and to take that step. And for us to be prepared. And what is our story? But if we're kind of just like mumbling around saying, well, you know, one time I heard this sermon that said this. One time like, I heard a Bible verse that say this. Or, you know, I have this priest named Father Nathaniel, and he said this one. No. Be prepared. Get focused. I do this whole church thing. I pursue God. Whatever your answer is. I don't want it to give you what your answer is. But what is your story? Because I promise you, there's going to become that encounter with you meeting someone at the well. Just as Jesus met someone at the well. You're going to meet someone. That might be a Starbucks. That might be a, a lunch hour at your work. But that is that encounter where Jesus met the woman at the well, where that conversation will come up. And we are called to be ready to share our story and why we want to pursue the fullness of life in Christ. Let's stand up for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we know that it is so tough to be uncomfortable. It is so tough for us to come out of our comfort zone, to have these conversations, to embrace it. Me, first and foremost, just want to find a way out of the conversation. But God, maybe you are calling us to take that step, to take that bold step into that conversation. And for us to embrace our story, God, give us the courage for us to just sit down, maybe just for five minutes this week, and for us to look what is my story? Why am I here? Why do I have any interest in who Jesus is? The more I'm able to look into that answer for myself, the more I can be a light to you. 
and bring not only change to myself, but those around me in amazing ways. It would help us to keep evangelism simple, help us to keep, keep being a light simple, help us to keep you being simple, because you are love, you are simple, and you desire for us to go from, from, from darkness to light, and for us to continue to take that step toward your love. Through the prayers of St. Mary, the Mother of God, St. Mark the Apostle, and all your saints, Lord, hear us as we all pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I uh, hope everyone has a great week. We will be back at the Doubletree Hub.